as you guys are going back to your seats, if you could help the ushers out by lifting up a hand and how many seats you have open next to you. If you got five seats, raise up five fingers. If you got one seat, raise up one. Raise them up real high. Ushers will help these guys get seated. Thank you so much. Keep them up for a little while. You guys can have a seat though. Keep your hands up. We got tons of space over here, you guys, on the left side. All right. All right. Awesome. Well, if you guys could help me welcome uh, the best children's ministry in the world, let's welcome this morning Team Kid. Christmas time, the most wonderful time of the year, a time we reflect on and remember that night when joy and hope came to the world in form of a tiny baby born in a manger. The greatest gift ever given, the love of God in flesh, came down to earth to provide for our salvation. Luke 2, 10, 11. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, Christ the Lord. Just 
Son, providing redeeming grace for all who put their trust in him. That is the true gift of Christmas, the birth of Jesus Christ. You see, the arrival of Jesus in a manger 2,000 years ago was the beginning of the life he would live, only to be put on a cross as the price paid for our sins. His shed blood, the only way we can get to heaven. Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. I wonder, do we give Jesus the room in our hearts he so rightly deserves? Do we show devoted love and worship to him? Or do we get so caught up in the hustle and bustle of the holiday season that we forget to truly celebrate and reflect on the real heart of Christmas? This Christmas, Jesus deserves our devoted love and worship. Worship he can celebrate. He is the unfailing love and the only name by which we can be saved. One day we will all bow down and worship him.
Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. God's unfailing love sent down to redeem man. God gave us a precious gift. Just as Mary held God's precious gift to the world, so do we. Every year, week, and day, God places gospel, gospel opportunities before us to reach others for Jesus. Like Mary, we are chosen vessels responsible for bringing God's greatest gift to the world. Because there is opportunity, and while there is opportunity, we must see the people and continue to rise up and build God's kingdom. Like Mary, will you be the Lord serving? Take the light of the world into the darkness. John three sixteen. For God to love the world, that He gave His one and only Son, so we could be His hands, His feet, His love. Give this Christmas away. Yeah. 
may God use each and every one of these gospel opportunities being sent from Life House in a form of a shoebox gift to reach children and families with the good news of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, please help these shoeboxes be a key to to show this love to our children who have a sick or in war. Please help them be a tool and open doors to show the gospel. In the precious name we pray, amen. All right, while they're kind of winding down, you guys can hear me. Try to pay attention because I want to take a moment just to honor Letitia. In case you don't know, this is Letitia Britton, our children's director. We all love Tish. I, I texted her this week, and I mean it from the bottom of my heart. She literally is one of my favorite persons in the entire world. Our church is so blessed. One of the core values that we have at LifeHouse is legacy, always investing in the next generation. And if there's anyone at this church that shows us what it looks like to invest in the next generation every day, it's Letitia. She loves the Lord. She loves these children so much, and they can tell that's why they love her back. We are so grateful. Tish, thank you for everything you do. Honestly, I just have to say something. Like, it, uh, this would not be possible without the countless leaders that are part of this. Amen. Like, I mean, the Jennifer, the Tammy that makes our videos, and uh, all our leaders, Harmony, Carolyn. I mean, I could go on and on. And, I mean, I just kind of manage the pieces, but without them, it wouldn't be possible. There's like <laughs> but um, honestly, I can't thank you, Mark. That, that's so kind. Well, the Our reason are the reason you have so many leaders is because your love is contagious. Well, so thank you for all you do. We love you. Yeah, big hand for Tish. Praise the Lord. Um, we are at this time, you know, we, we, we do a, a, a lot of different things here at Lifehouse. I love, um, this month, actually every week, we're going to have something exciting happen. Um, uh, but yeah, this is by far probably one of my best. I, I love watching them kids. I was getting a kick out of, uh, Hudson Gardner. What, what, what grade is he in? Huh? Anyway, Hudson Gardner's sitting here. <laughs> And his second grade, and his little brother's right here. So during the solo, well, that's a good time to get my brother's attention. Hey, Cannon, over here, Cannon, Cannon. I was just, I was dying. But I love, I love, I love kids, man. But, um, but what, a, what a wonderful um, opportunity that was just to watch them worship Christ. I don't know if you lost it, but when they, when they put their hands up like this, I'm like, oh, man, this is killing me. But, uh, but, man, just to watch our kids worship and know what they're doing as far as worship, not just hand motions. They know. You can, t you can tell it's coming straight from their heart. So, uh, but anyway, this time of the, the service, uh, we, we've worshiped through singing, and now this is the time we, we worship through giving. And uh, we understand here at Lifehouse Church that there's, uh, the things that God has given us are already his. We're just his stewards. We're stewards of his children. We're stewards of, of this, this church body of believers. And um, um, uh, next... Uh, week um pastor mark's going to let us know he's going to give us a rise report where all the the funds are going it's such an exciting uh thing right now this time of year to, to be giving out thousands of thousands hundreds of thousands of dollars going out of side of these walls uh to places uh some before have never heard or even uh heard the name of jesus christ so i think that's awesome but uh what your gift is doing today is going to be multiplied and go out i promise you so we we're privileged and honored to invest in uh, what God is doing all around the world. And uh, let's pray right now as the ushers come forward, as we give our gifts. There's multiple ways to give. Uh, those options are on the screen um, behind me. So please consider that. If you're a guest today, um, this is not... Uh, to, to, uh, uh, this is not for you guys. This is for regular attenders and partners. If you want to give, that's between you and the Lord. But we don't want to uh, have you feel pressure today. But thank you for giving, if this, for, for coming, if this is your very first time at LifeHouse. If you didn't receive your gift when you came in for being a first-time guest, on your way out, you can, you can get your gift at the top of the steps outside at the New Here tent on your left. So please do that. Again, I, f I hope you feel welcome. I hope you come back. Let's pray for the offering. Father, we thank you for your love for us. God, we thank you for the opportunity to give back, which already belongs to you. God, you are awesome. God, thank you for our children, Lord. You have, you have 
just blessed us, Lord. Help us to be those good stewards of these kids, teaching them uh, to worship and how to worship. And um, God, as you receive these gifts this morning, may they be 100% for your glory, for your kingdom, for no personal gain, Lord. This is for you. So we ask that you bless these gifts. Bless each giver in Jesus' name. Amen. Just where we go and help us to be wise in times when we don't know. Let this be our prayer. When we When stars go out each night, turn us to the sea. Nella mia preghiera, let this be our prayer. Quanta felice. When shadows fill our day, lead us to a place. Every child, just like every child, need to find a place. Guide us with your grace, give us faith so we'll be safe. Continue the heart of that song that was a prayer. Father, we do. We look to you. We ask you to guide us. Give us eyes to see what you want us to see, the people, the truth. 
Lord, and give us the faith to respond to that truth, to go where you send us, to do what you're calling us to do for your glory, oh God. And if it's for your glory, then it's for our good. So Lord, bless this time. We believe that your word is true. We rest in its power. Lord, as your servant, I stand first and foremost before you, and I want to be obedient and faithful to that which you, and speak that which you want to speak to this congregation today for your glory. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I know we've already had church and we could just go home right now uh, with, with, with the kids and the gospel that was shared there. But I want to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 1. And we're going to start in verse 57 this morning and go through the rest of that chapter. Basically just picking up where we left off last week. If you're visiting today, I want to let you know we have been, we started another journey here at our church. Going through the gospel of Luke and we, we will do so verse by verse until we get all the way through it. And it's a joy. Um, Luke, who wrote this while you're turning there, just to give you some context, Luke was a doctor, a physician by trade. He was trained. And you can see the flavor of that as he writes this gospel from his perspective. Uh, He says in the beginning that he has carefully considered all the evidence and his, his whole goal in writing this gospel was that the person he was writing to, he says his name is Theophilus, but really he could be writing it to us all, that Theophilus would be convinced of that which Luke was convinced of, that which I'm convinced of, and many of us are convinced of, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God sent to save. That he died on a cross, that he rose again on the third day. Luke is all about informing us of this information, and he says that he's done so in a very orderly detail, just like a doctor would do. If you think about a doctor, when someone comes to them with a diagnosis, he assesses the situation, he's very educated. And so he looks at all the details, and that's what Luke has done in sharing this gospel with us. Leading up to this specific passage, we're going to see the birth of John the Baptist. And you're thinking, why would him wanting us to know about Jesus, why would he want us to know about John the Baptist? Well, what we're looking at right now is a sort of prequel to the story about Jesus. So with Jesus' birth, we'll look at that in Luke chapter 2. This is everything that leads up to that it's kind of the drum roll, if you will, for the, for the main event when Jesus is born. So Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 57, and the three points of this morning are, we're going to see a new name declared. Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, declares a new name out of nowhere. He declares a new song. I mean, his heart is so filled with what God is doing, the work that God has revealed to him. He can't help but sing this amazing song declaring the truth. It's a new song. And then third, we are going to see John or Zechariah declare that it is a new day, the day of salvation. So a new name, a new song, a new day. Would you stand with me as we read? Starting in Luke chapter 1, verse 57, we're standing in reverence for God and because we believe this is his holy word. Starting in verse 7, Luke writes, Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day when they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father, But his mother answered, no, he shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, no, his name is John. And they all wondered. They were all amazed. And verse 64, and immediately Zechariah's mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the new song. And prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and at the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us, that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear and in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. 
And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child, John the Baptist, grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Father God, would you bless the reading of your holy word. Amen. Would you be seated? So a new name, a new song, and a new day are declared in this passage of scripture. If you remember, Luke and Elizabeth are advanced in years. That's the way they put it. That's the politically correct way of just basically saying they were old. Right, I mean, that could be relative advanced in years. I'm advanced in years, but it wouldn't be miraculous for Tammy and I. It'd be crazy for Tammy and I to have a baby at this time in our lives, but it wouldn't be miraculous. Zechariah and Elizabeth are way beyond that. And what's going on right now, this is a drum roll. So God's been silent for 400 years. The last prophecy was delivered in Malachi, and so for 400 years, God's people, they're going through things, they're struggling, they're praying, and God seems so distant. God seems so uncaring. God, where are you? The Romans were oppressing them as a people, and they were desperate, praying many prayers. Elizabeth specifically praying for a child, but all those prayers seemed to fall on deaf ears. God seemed distant. But what's so clear in this drum roll leading up to the main event, the, the Jesus being born, is John the Baptist being born. It was a miracle. It was clear to everyone around, to Zechariah and Elizabeth specifically, that God was at work. God was starting to do things that only God could do, and it was so clear to everyone. And so when Elizabeth had a baby... Everyone took note. I mean, they couldn't believe it, and it couldn't have happened to a better couple. In this culture and context, in that day, everything was about the next generation. It was about legacy and having children. So if you were barren, if you couldn't have children, then people thought, oh, well, you must be living in sin. Or maybe there's some hidden thing in your life that God is not honoring your request to him. That wasn't the case. Zechariah and Elizabeth were faithful Zechariah were considered to be righteous among their people. Everyone loved Zechariah and Elizabeth. And so when this Elizabeth, who all she wanted was to have a child, a baby, when she, verse 57, when the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son, all her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. Everyone was thrilled for Elizabeth. Everyone was amazed that God gave this faithful woman a baby at this stage in her life. They couldn't believe it. It was clear that God was up to something. They rejoiced. And on the eighth day, and this was according to custom, and because Zechariah was a priest, they were faithful to God, Elizabeth, they were going to abide by the rules. They were going to follow the customs of their people. On the eighth day, that's what they did. The sons were circumcised. And so... According to the custom, on the eighth day, verse 59, they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called the child Zechariah, again, according to custom, after his father, Zechariah Jr. But his mother answered, no, he shall be called John, which basically just means Jehovah is gracious. No, he shall be called John, not Zechariah. And verse 61, and they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. Who's John? This is a new name. We don't know anyone else named John in your family. Why would you name your baby John? Why would you not name him Zechariah? And they made signs to his father, Zechariah, inquiring what he wanted him, his son, to be called. Now, we know that Zechariah was mute. If you remember when the angel, Gabriel, appeared to Zechariah and told him that his wife was going to have a son, Zechariah didn't believe. This was too fantastic for him. And so because he did not believe, the angel said, you're not going to be able to speak until the baby comes. So we knew that he was mute. There's a lot of commentary is why would these people be making signs? And some people believe that he was not just mute, but also deaf. Some people believe, or there's commentary that says because he was just old, sometimes your hearing goes a little bit. My hearing hasn't gone, but my eyesight has gone. These things just go because I'm advanced in years, right? 
Um, some people say that that's the reason. I kind of just picture it, and I, really, to me, it's just a detail that isn't a big deal, but me just picturing it in my head, I'm picturing Elizabeth holding this child just in awe and wonder that she actually has a baby, that God gave her a baby. And she said, no, his name is John, you know, and, and if mom ain't happy and nobody happy, so she's holding this baby and she's saying, no, it's John. And they're looking at Zechariah and they're going, is that all right with you? I mean, they're making signs. Is this okay? And he says, yes, his name shall be John. Where does this name come from? This is a new name. If you remember, God or the angel told him earlier, his name shall be John. And I believe this whole testimony, this record, this detail is just to communicate to us that none of this is arbitrary. None of this is coincidence. This is shared with us to show us that God has a plan and it is very specific and it is very detailed. God has a plan. His name is to be called John. We're told in the scripture that God knits us together in our mother's womb. He knows who we are. He knows our name. He didn't know just John's name. He knows our name. In scripture, we're told that he cares for us so we can cast all our anxieties upon him. He sees us. He knows us. And he loves us. That's why he sent Jesus. That's why this gospel is written, so that we can consider this gospel, this information, and believe this information, respond to it, and place our faith and trust in the Jesus of this information, and by being, placing our faith in him, being saved. He knows your name. His name shall be called John. He asked for a writing tablet and made sure. I, it doesn't say that there's an exclamation point here, but I'm sure he was very emphatic about it. His name is John. And we're told that they all wondered. They didn't wonder why they named him John specifically. They wondered as in they were amazed at what was taking place. Not all, not all that's written here may lead us to wonder and be amazed or at all, but what Luke is detailing and recording as he talked to people who were there first hand eyewitnesses. He, these people that shared this testimony said, based on what was going on at that time, that they were all amazed. They all wondered, God is up to something. And then we're told that when Zechariah wrote that on the tablet, verse 64, we're told immediately his mouth was opened. And the first thing he did was bless God. He spoke blessing God. And I assure you, it was not timidly, it was boldly. I mean, in the scriptures, we're told that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And he sang this song, and I'm sure he sang it at the top of his lungs. He hadn't been able to speak for nine months. He'd seen his wife progressing in pregnancy and holding out for hope. I mean, is she going to actually be able to deliver this baby, this long-awaited child? All we wanted our whole lives was to have a child, and now we have a child. And his mouth is opened, and he sang a song, and it was a beautiful song. He spoke blessing God, giving glory to God. And we're told next that in, in light of all these things, and in light of his testimony, fear came on all their neighbors now, not, uh, they weren't terrified, like afraid fear. They were in awe and revered God because of what was taking place. Clearly, God's power was being demonstrated in and through this situation. And so they all feared God. They all revered him, all their neighbors and all their families. And then we're told that all these things that were taking place were talked about, testified of, throughout all the hill country of Judea, and all who heard them did not dismiss them. They maybe didn't understand exactly what God was up to. They didn't maybe understand all the details and specifically what was taking place, but they were all in awe, they were all wondering, they were all amazed, and in so instead of just dismissing them, they held them up in their hearts until they figured out what was going on. That's something that I don't see a lot of people in our culture do. So easily, if we don't understand things about the gospel or about the word of God, we just brush it off. We dismiss it. 
not to do that. This is God's holy word. And often we testify here that there are things in scripture that are a hard pill for us to swallow. There are things that we don't understand, things that don't make sense to us. The Bible tells us clearly that we see dimly now, but there will be a day that we see clearly. And so we're to accept the fact that his ways are higher than our ways. He may seem distant, but we're promised that he's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. We're promised that he hears our prayers, that he cares for us, that he knows our name. And so we treasure those promises, even though it doesn't seem like it, even though it doesn't feel like it all the time. We hold those truths in our heart, just like these people, their friends and neighbors did. They laid them up in their hearts, saying, considering, what then will this child be? For it's clear that the hand of the Lord was with this child, was with him. It's obvious that God was at work. I encourage you to look for God at work and join him where he's at work, right? The truth from experiencing God, one of my favorite Bible studies. We're told in scripture, seek me and find me. God's not playing games with us. He loves us. He wants us to find him. He wants us to know the truth. We're promised in scripture. If we seek the truth, we will find the truth. So consider the truth. Don't reject it or dismiss it just because you don't understand it all right away. Seek to understand it. And what God promises is that you will understand it. And that's why Luke wrote this gospel. I encourage you to read it and consider it. And I have faith that you'll believe if you consider it sincerely and genuinely and by faith in God. So a new name is declared, John, out of nowhere. And then we see a new song. And again, if you picture, these are real people, Zechariah and Elizabeth, advanced in years, God finally giving them a son, but beyond God giving them a son, God reveals to Zechariah what he's up to specifically. And he can't help but sing. This is a prophecy. When I thought about this testimony, it reminded me of my own testimony. And I'm sure many of you can relate to this. One of my favorite passages of scripture is Psalm chapter 40 where David testified, he said, I waited patiently on the Lord. It was David, King David was going through a very hard time. He was struggling. God seemed distant. He had offered many prayers up to God, but it seemed that God wasn't answering his prayers. And so he said, I I, I prayed to God. I lifted my voice to God. And then finally, in God's perfect timing, what David testifies in Psalm 40 is that he inclined to me. He heard my prayer and David said, he brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay and he set my feet upon a rock. But that's not all he did. In doing that, David said, he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. And then David went on to say, many are gonna hear this song and see and trust and fear the Lord because of his testimony. That's what's going on here with Zechariah's testimony. He's declaring what God is up to so that no one has to be confused, so that everyone will know that God is at work and these are the prophecies being fulfilled. Zechariah was also prophesied of in the book of Isaiah and also in Malachi. So hundreds of years prior, not only was the Messiah, the Savior prophesied, but also the forerunner, the one who would, in, in, in a regard, till the soil for when the Savior would come. That was John's ministry to break up that fallow ground, those hard hearts of all the people who were just so calloused to the the truths of scripture. John, his purpose was to break up that fallow ground, to till that soil and get ready for when Jesus comes on the scene. That was John the Baptist's ministry. David said, and he sang that new song, God delivered him. And that's basically what Zechariah is about to sing. God is about to deliver. God is about to come true to his promises. He is about to faithfully deliver what he promised to deliver long ago, a savior who will redeem you, save you. He sings this beautiful song starting in verse 67. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit. So these aren't his words. These are God's words through him. Filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied, declared, proclaimed truth. And he sang, saying, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. For he has visited and redeemed his people. God showed Zechariah exactly what he was about to do. Visit and redeem his people. And it was going to be a good visit. He wasn't coming to visit to pour out his wrath upon them. He was coming to redeem them. He was coming to set them free. They were slaves of sin. 
And he was coming to redeem them from their sin, to set them free. Right? Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. That was the ministry that Jesus came to do. And God showed Zechariah that because people were wondering, what then will this child be? Well, Zechariah is about to tell them what he will be and beyond that, what he is uh, prepared to do in, in preparing the way for the Messiah. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. For him to say he raised up a horn of salvation, horns were a symbol of strength. So it wasn't going to be just any savior. It was going to be a mighty savior. It was going to be a strong savior. And our savior Jesus is strong to redeem. He is mighty to save. And that's basically what he was saying as he's singing this song. He has raised up for us a horn of salvation like a rhinoceros horn is strong and can do some damage and can, and can fight. He raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, this was all prophesied. Just as promised, God raised up a horn of salvation, a mighty savior from of old. And we should, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Now listen, later on in the song, we're going to see, see that specifically he's saving them from their sins. I'm amazed as I talk to so many people who claim saving faith, so many people in our culture and country that call themselves Christians, and they're so uncomfortable with this word saved. Read the Gospels. Jesus came, he said, to seek and save the lost. All throughout scripture, it's talked about God sending to save his people. Why the uncomfort with the word saved? Listen, the wages of sin is death. There is no one righteous, no, not one. We all are sinners in need of a Savior. God sent a Savior in sending Jesus. He raised up a horn of salvation that we should be saved from our enemies and from all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers, right? What's mercy? Mercy is God withholding from us that which we deserve. What do we deserve as sinners? hell. The wages of sin is death. And so God promised to show his people mercy to withhold from them that which they deserve and instead send them a horn of salvation. He shows grace and mercy. Our God is gracious and merciful and he shows mercy in sending Jesus. He promised to the fathers that he would send them and to remember his holy covenant. He made a covenant. He's not going to break a covenant because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is faithful even when we are faithless. The promise, the covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us. And I love this verse. And this is really the verse that I really wrote this weekend today. He did all this, sent a savior, a horn of salvation to save us from our enemies. Verse 74, not just so that we can go on about our business and do our own thing, right? No, that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear and might serve him in holiness and righteousness before him, not just on Sundays, all our days. Right, remember what Jesus says in John chapter four, the Father, Father God, is seeking, desiring to find those who will worship him in spirit and in truth, not the way they're comfortable with, the way the spirit of God he sends in their hearts leads them to do, and not half-heartedly, right? wholeheartedly. We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if we love him that much and in that way, it's not just going to be on Sundays. It's going to be every day, all our days. Is that how you serve him? And that word serve specifically can also be translated worship. Is that how you worship the Lord? Do you worship him in spirit and in truth? Remember Joshua's testimony in the Old Testament when God literally delivered all his people from slavery in Egypt? They had been slaves, literally oppressed for hundreds and hundreds of years and God sets them free miraculously. Remember, he parts the water for them. They walk through on dry ground and all their enemies that are pursuing them that want to bring them back into slavery, he, he de demolishes all their enemies and they eventually make it to the promised land and Joshua, their leader, 
tells them, reminds them all the things that God has done and reminds them who God is and what he's done. And he said, consider all that. Consider who he is and what he's done and serve the Lord in sincerity and in faithfulness. Fear him. Don't fear anyone else. Serve the Lord in sincerity and in faithfulness. Don't go on about your business and forget him. Worship him. Serve him. He is worthy of service. And Joshua says, as for me and my house, We're going to serve the Lord. And he tells the people, look, God doesn't want half your heart. He wants your whole heart. He told them, if you think it's good to go serve and worship the gods that you were delivered from in Egypt, then go do that. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That's what's going on here. We being delivered from the hand of our enemies. Why did he do that? that we might serve and worship him without fear. Brothers and sisters, we were created to worship. And we're worshiping, we're serving something. The question is, is it the right thing? Is it him? One of my favorite testimonies that I share all the time in the Gospel of Luke is the gospel where Jesus healed the 10 lepers. You remember that testimony? Leprosy in the, the New Testament, in the gospel, it's not something that we see a lot in our culture today because medicine had advanced. But in that culture, leprosy was a disease that was a picture. Leprosy was physically what sin is to men spiritually. And so in that culture, people, they all knew what a leper looked like. Leper, le- your skin just rots away. It wastes away. Your fingers fall off. Your nose falls off. The wages of sin is death. And leprosy, again, was physically what sin is to us spiritually. And Jesus heals 10 lepers. They had, by law in this country and culture, they had, by law, were were demanded to to stand a specific amount of far feet away from people because they were thinking that it was a very contagious disease and no one else wanted leprosy. So when you got leprosy, you were outcast. And these lepers had heard what that there was this guy, Jesus, and they heard about what he was doing and what he was saying. And so they saw him coming from a distance and from a distance because they had leprosy, they shouted, oh, Jesus, have mercy on us. Heal us, do for us what no one else can do for us. Heal us. And Jesus heals them. He shows mercy to them. And then he tells them to go to the priests and to to share because the priests were the ones that were to invite them. If for some reason they were ever to be healed, no one ever got healed. But these 10 lepers got healed, so they were to be invited back into the society by the priest. They did that. But when they did that, nine of the lepers, nine of the 10, went on about their business. They forgot Jesus. And one, only one returned and bowed at the feet of Jesus. He couldn't but express gratitude and thankfulness for God for what he had done in his life. He bowed at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus said, where are the other nine? Where are the other nine? Has only one come to return? Brothers and sisters, what do you do? Listen, I get it. It's hard. We live in a world full of distractions. We live in a world that is pulling at us, tugging at us, drawing us away from the one that we need to worship. But we have been saved for a reason, for a purpose. That reason is specified right in this verse. We, you and I, if you are saved, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, from sin, and we'll see later that that's what he's talking about, not the Romans, sin might serve him without fear. Remember what it says in Hebrews 4.16? Because, because of Jesus and because of what he has done, we can boldly approach his throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. We who are sinners deserving of condemnation don't need to be afraid to approach a holy, righteous God. Through Jesus Christ, we can stand before him. We can have a relationship with him. We in our sin are at enmity with him. God's not okay with sin, but there is Romans 8, 1, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in right Christ Jesus. So we can serve him without fear. We can worship, we can come before him and we can know him, we can talk to him, we can pray to him without fear, boldly knowing that he will hear because he loves us and that he cares for us. He might not answer in the way we think he should, in the way and the time we think he should, but brothers and sisters, he knows better than we do. And he knows your name and his plan is specific. It's not coincidence, it's not arbitrary. 
See that in the naming of John. It is specific. He knows your name. He sees you. He cares for you. You being delivered from the hand of your enemies might serve him without fear and in holiness and in righteousness, not your way, his way. In holiness and in righteousness, in spirit and in truth, not just Sundays, all your days. Right? The Apostle Paul said it this way in Romans 12.1. In light of who God is, in light of what he's done, in light of the salvation, Paul said, I urge you, therefore, brothers, in light of the mercies of God, to offer your bodies. Don't offer anything else. Don't offer half your body. Offer yourself, all of yourself to him. He goes on to say, this is the acceptable worship. No one's given a gift to God that he might be repaid. But what you can do, you can't repay him adequately. But what you can do is offer yourself, and joyfully so. You won't be burdened in doing that. You will be blessed in doing that. You don't have to be afraid stepping up to the plate with your body, offering yourself. You might serve him, worship him without fear. You need to know that God loves you. He demonstrated his love for you and that while you were still a sinner, he sent Jesus to die for you on a cross. You have nothing to fear. Right? God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. So worship him. And if there is something that is hindering you, if there's an obstacle in your way, I can assure you he wants to remove it. So let him. And if all you need to do is let go, let go. And worship him without fear. He is a good, sovereign God who sent his son to die for you so that you can serve him without fear. Not in comfort, doesn't say that, but without fear. And in holiness and righteousness all your days. And then we see the last point. We see him declare in this song a new day. It's a new day. A new day has dawned. Hear the drum roll. A new day is dawning. Paul goes on to testify in 2 Corinthians 6 2, behold, after Christ comes, he says, behold, now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may not be the day of salvation, but God has graciously offered an opportunity for men who cannot save themselves to be saved. One day he will come and pour out wrath, but today is not that day. Today is the day of salvation. And so we need to consider this truth, the gospel, and respond to it. He's announcing a new day here. He says, you child, talking about John the Baptist, his son that God miraculously gave him. I'm sure he's still in awe. No one can believe these things are being talked about all throughout the countryside. Can you believe what God has done? No one could deny that God was at work here. No one else could do what God was doing. And God has given him this clear vision of what was taking place, that it was the day of visitation. Jesus, the Messiah, the promised king was coming. He's about to be born. He's so filled up singing praises. And he says, you child will be called the prophet of the most high. That one testified and prophesied of in addition to the savior in Isaiah and Malachi. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. John, you're going to till the soil. You are going to get people ready. You're going to tell people to remove those obstacles to make the path straight. You're going to tell people to turn from their sin where they're clouded and their visions are, are going to blind them and turn to the Lord so that they can see the salvation that he's providing him. And John, you're going to give knowledge. You're going to share the truth of salvation that it's possible to his people in the forgiveness of sins. So there, right? It's not talking about the Romans Salvation from the forgiveness of their sins. Brothers and sisters, if you're not saved, you need to be saved from your sins and maybe from other people and other things too, but specifically from your sins. Eternity's long. Salvation is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, not because of who you are, not by what you may think you might accomplish or what you do, but because of what he has done, because of who he is. I don't know the name of the child that declared Acts 4.12 in the Christmas program, but clearly scripture says salvation, Acts 4.12, salvation, again, salvation, it's in there all the time, over and over. You need to be saved. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name given 
under heaven among men by which we must be saved. No other name. Jesus himself says, John 14, 6, I am the way. He doesn't say I am a way. He says I am the way, the truth furthermore, and the life furthermore. And he says no one, not one person can approach the Father or get to the Father except through me. I'm it. I mean, you can't be more clear than that. He leaves no room for any other interpretation. Scripture leaves no other room for interpretation. So why the confusion in our culture today? There's one way. Jesus is our only hope. He is your only hope. Hope, salvation is possible. And John's ministry was all about telling the people of God, giving them the knowledge to know that salvation is here. Forgiveness of sins is possible because of, get this, not because of who they were. Verse 77, or excuse me, verse 78, not because of who they were, because of the tender mercies of our God. Because of him. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, but by his doing, we are in Christ Jesus, who has become to us the wisdom of God. Not by our doing, not by pastor so-and-so's doing, not by such-and-such church's doing, by his doing, we are in Christ Jesus, who has become to us the wisdom of God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. By his doing, by the tender mercies of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, referring back to a prophecy in Malachi. The sun is rising, a new day is dawning. He's declaring the day of salvation. The day of salvation is here, the sunrise. Can you see it coming basically is what he's saying. Picture it, that that sun just peeking over the horizon. It's coming up, salvation is here. Can you hear the joy in his voice? He cannot help but sing this song. I think about what Peter and John write in Acts, one of my favorite testimonies about them. It's all my favorite. I know I keep saying it's my favorite passage. It's all my favorite, right? But Peter and John, they were were sharing the gospel, basically singing after it happened what Zechariah is, is, is saying, declaring. And they were arrested. They were put in prison. They were persecuted and tortured for their faith, for simply sharing the good news, this message of Jesus Christ, that salvation is possible and that it is through Jesus And so they warned them, or excuse me, they threatened them. And they told them, their beaten and battered bodies, they told them, we order you, we command you not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. In other words, we don't want you to tell the truth. And if you do, we're coming after you. Do you remember what Peter and John said in response? Very respectfully, I believe, they said, we cannot help but speak of that which we have seen and heard. We cannot help declare that salvation is possible. We cannot help help but proclaim and declare that there is a way of salvation. Is that what you do, brothers and sisters? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Do you understand and know who God is and what he's done for you? I believe that's why Paul prayed for the church in Ephesians. And he said, oh, church, that you would know, that you would understand how much God loves you. He said that you would know what is the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of his amazing love that surpasses knowledge. I believe he prayed that prayer because if they understood how much God loved him, they would sing about him. They would worship him. They would serve him without fear. Brothers and sisters, let us serve him in that way. Oh, that we would know what is the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of his amazing love. It's amazing love that surpasses knowledge. It's beyond our finite comprehension. It's infinite love. Because of him, the mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from high. He's coming to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Jesus says in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me doesn't have to walk in darkness anymore. No more darkness. It's time for light. The light, the sun is coming up. Follow me. Place your faith and trust in me. I'm the light of the world. If you believe in me, you don't have to walk in darkness anymore. You don't have to sit there. You don't have to wallow there. You don't have to be hopeless anymore. You can follow me. I am the light of the world, Jesus declared. Salvation is here. It's a new day. 
and to guide our feet in the way of peace. So follow Jesus and you'll go from enmity with God to peace with God. You will be reconciled with a holy, righteous God. Remember, he hates sin. So you got to deal with your sin before you approach him. And the only way you can do that is in and through Jesus Christ. Because it is in him, Romans 8, 1, that there is therefore now no condemnation. He is our righteousness. Peace with God. You can have peace with God. And then said we're told that the child, by testimony, the child, John the Baptist, grew and became strong in spirit. And he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. This is the drum roll. This is the prequel to that main event. The sun is coming. The sun is rising. Today is the day of salvation. And brothers and sisters, tomorrow may not be. You have opportunity today. You may not have opportunity tomorrow. God has raised up a horn of salvation. He is mighty to save, strong to save. No matter how far you think you are, from him, no matter how deep in sin you think you are, he has raised up a horn of salvation for you. And the blood of Jesus Christ, because it wasn't just another man's blood, because it was the son of God's blood, it was Jesus's blood. He, it was sufficient to wash away the sins for all men for all time, no matter how, whoa, whoa, that scared me. <laughs> whoa. Okay, I gotta regroup here. Seriously, consider this truth. Don't dismiss it. Don't reject it. You may not understand everything. Faith is a part of the equation. We walk by faith. But consider it. Seek the truth while you have the opportunity to seek the truth. I know that many are here, maybe some grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends that came to see the Christmas program, never been to our church before. No one's here by accident. God wants you to know him. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance, that everyone, no matter who they are, no matter where they've been, no matter what they've done, he wants everyone to turn to him and be saved. He wants everyone's sins to be washed away. And I'm telling you from firsthand experience, he can wash away some pretty big sins. The blood of Christ is sufficient for you. In the Bible, it says, everyone who calls upon his name shall be saved. And everyone means everyone, that includes you. So in a moment, we're gonna pray. And my prayer is that if you've not placed your faith and trust in Jesus, you would do it today. And that you would celebrate Christmas in a way you never celebrated Christmas before with the Son of God living in your heart. First John 5, 11 and 12 says, he who has the Son, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. Nowhere else, it's in his son. He who has the son has life, but he who does not have the son of God does not have life. That's the testimony. So either you have Jesus and you have life or you don't have Jesus and you don't have life. Which is it? If you don't have Jesus and you don't have life, I want you to know that right now he's offered to you and all you need to do is accept him, receive him, call upon his name, and you'll have him, and you'll have life. Let's pray. Father God, do what only you can do. Right now, oh Lord, you are mighty to save still. You did raise up a horn of salvation, and I know that by firsthand experience. It's my testimony. It took a strong Savior to save me, to redeem my life. And, oh, God, I know that what you did for me when I wasn't looking for you, you can do for someone else here this morning, a man, a woman, who maybe came in uninterested, maybe thinking, maybe annoyed even. But, God, greater are you that are in us than he that is in the world. And I pray that you will move whatever obstacle, part whatever waters that need to be parted to save and redeem a soul this morning. 
If you're here, sir, if you're here, ma'am, and you understand that you are a sinner in need of a savior, and you're ready to call upon the name of Jesus for salvation and ask him into your heart. You're ready to repent of your sin and turn to a holy, righteous God who loves you. And you're ready to receive the gift that he holds out before you right now as I'm speaking, his son, Jesus Christ. I encourage you to pray this prayer. Call upon his name. Say Jesus in your heart. Just say Jesus. He sees your heart. He hears your heart. Say Jesus. I understand that I am a sinner in need of a savior. And so the best I know how, I repent of my sin. I turn from it and I turn to you in hopes that you will save me. I ask you to forgive all my sins, to wash them away, just like Mark talked about, just like the Bible says. Forgive all my sins and please come into my heart. Live in me. I want you. I want to serve you and worship you. So show me, lead me in how to do that. The best I know how, Lord, I pray that you will save me and forgive my sins. And I pray this in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, just so that we can rejoice with you, if that's you, if you prayed that prayer, no one's gonna embarrass you, no one's gonna call you forward. I'm just looking because I wanna know I I love to know where God is at work. If he's at work in you, if he's knocked on the door of your heart and you opened it this morning, if you prayed that prayer, would you just testify of that by lifting your hand? Would you just acknowledge and say, that's me, Mark. I prayed that prayer. I asked Jesus to save me and to forgive my sins. Is there anyone here who, who would testify of that this morning? Father, you see and you know. Continue to work. Raise up a people who are willing to serve you without fear in holiness and righteousness. Not a people who will go on about their way and forget you like those nine lepers, but that will return and serve you and worship you and love you because you love them first. A people who are willing to offer their bodies as living sacrifices for your glory find much joy in doing so. Lead us, Spirit of God, in true worship. Church, let's stand and sing. The altar's open. Come and kneel and pray for God to